All right, open your Bibles this morning, Romans chapter 6. Before we begin this morning, you know, I have been the pastor of this assembly now for over 20 years. Not here, but ever since we had Bible study, we started out as Bible studies in homes many years ago, before I even met my wife, and then forever and ever. I can tell you that during this tenure, I have never been politically active. I have not been a political activist, so to speak. All my messages are on YouTube, and you could go back and listen to all my messages, and even during the last two political campaigns, as much as I disagreed with everything that was happening, those were the Obama campaigns, I never said one word about politics from my pulpit, and I still don't plan to. My contention has always been that it doesn't matter who becomes the president of the United States, there is no way to rescue the downward spiral that this world is in. There just is no way to do that. So anybody who thinks that a man getting into the White House or a woman getting into the White House is going to solve anything, any of the ailments in this country or in this world are wrong. They are desperately wrong. Because this world will never be changed until Jesus Christ takes up his place and makes it the way it's supposed to be. And only then will it be the perfect place to live. Until then, this place is a sinking ship. And the only thing that people can do is try to patch up the holes on the sinking ship, but even that's not working because it's sinking faster than they can patch it up. Okay? Evil men will wax worse and worse, is what the Bible says. And so, everything that's happening now is only smoke. It's all smoke. Smoke and mirrors. Because there is no real validity to this process. Now, having said that, I do find this election process to be different from anything I've ever seen in the past. And I do find it to be extremely interesting simply because the people on both sides are willing to fight about it. Even they're willing to die for this. And it seems to me that as these protests evolve and get bigger, and some will get more violent, some people will die. I think some people will die in these riots. If they don't die of the riot itself, they'll die of an accident in the riot. They'll be shot. There's going to be some things that will happen just by the way things are escalating. Just the way things have been taken out of proportion and distorted. It's almost scary to see what's happening now in the United States of America as a result of this. So I'm going to make some comments about what's happening. And I really wonder how many people are thinking the things that I have thought in my own mind or and probably have never spoken them or have never said them. So for a few minutes, I'm basically just going to be thinking out loud. That's all I'm going to be doing. I'm not trying to sway or persuade anybody, but here's what I think in my own mind, okay? Trump talked about vetting Muslims, right? Vetting means to uh, verify their documentation before they come into the country, know who they are, know what their background is like, see if they have any terrorist affiliations in their background, things like that before they enter in the United States. Now, this issue of vetting them only came up after the San Bernardino, California shootings where those two Muslims killed 14 innocent people in cold blood. You remember that, right? And as a result of that, or I should say in, as a reaction to that, Trump said publicly that he's going to stop Muslims from coming into the country. And then he defined what he meant by saying that he wanted to have them vetted before they enter the country. And of course, my question is, is it wrong 
to know who's entering the borders of your country? Is it wrong to know that? I mean, is it a secret that extremist jihadist Muslims want to kill infidels? Well, that's not a secret. I mean, they announce it on TV. The, the, the whole world knows. Look what's happened in France. They're, getting, they're shooting them there. They're, they're in Germany, in Brussels. They're getting shot everywhere. It's not a secret. It's not a secret. But what really got me about that event that took place several months ago is what was not asked by the media, Republican or Democrat, did not ask or make comments about what I thought was so important and should have been brought to light and manifested for everybody to see. And to me, the logical thing to have said in those days would have been this. That mosque where those two killers came out of, had that mosque been approached the day before the San Bernardino shootings, and had someone asked the people there, do you have any terrorists in your mosque? There would have been an uproar. They would have, they would have, they would have said, why are you asking such an unjust question? Of course we don't have any terrorists in our mosque. We are a peacekeeping, we are a, a loving thing, we are a loving mosque. We hate terror, we hate violence, we hate killing. Of course we don't have any terrorists in our mosque. Okay, okay, I was just asking. Just asking. So there are no terrorists in your mosque, right? No, of course not. And you should never ask such an accusing question. Okay, I'm sorry. All right. Just wanted to be sure. And then the next day, 14 people are shot, cold-blooded, by people who came from that love-keeping, friendly, peaceful mosque. Now, here's the important question that I feel was avoided for whatever reason. It wasn't asked. Someone should have gone to that mosque the day after those killings or a week after, after everything calmed down a little bit, and said, had we asked you if there were any terrorists in your mosques, in your mosque before that shooting, you would have said, of course not, right? Yeah, but would you have been right? No, you would not have been right. You would have been wrong because you didn't know that those two killers were in your midst. And obviously, you didn't know. So let me ask you this now. Are there any terrorists in your mosques now? No, of course not, is what probably the answer they would give. To which we would respond, how do you know? You didn't know about the first two that were there. How do you know the answer to that question this time? So let me rephrase the question for you. Uh, is it possible that there are terrorists in your mosque now? And before you answer that question, let me help you with the answer. The answer is yes, it's possible that there are terrorists in your mosque right now because you already admitted that you don't know. And based on the fact that we know that extremist Muslims have an agenda to kill infidels, then it is possible that there are terrorists, not only in your mosque, but in any mosque in the United States of America. Are the two San Bernardino, California terrorists the only two terrorists who snuck through our borders, who came through customs unnoticed? Are those the only two who infiltrated our country incognito? And I'm just asking. I'm just asking. I mean, is it possible that there are more than two, like the two who killed 14 people in cold blood? Is it possible? 
does that possibility exist? So is it wrong to want to vet Muslims before we allow them to enter into the borders of the United States? I mean, is it wrong to make that request? But here's the thing. Should it only be Muslims who are vetted? No. Every person who enters into the borders of the United States who comes through our borders should be vetted. Absolutely they should. Listen, even peace-loving, friendly Muslims don't want extremist, jihadist Muslims coming into this country. I mean, there are good Muslims out there. I mean, the Muslims that we know, most of them, I mean, I go to their stores all the time. They're in this country because they want peace. They don't want war. They don't want trouble. They don't want their children being killed. They love their children like we love their children, like we love our children. So it was the San Bernardino, California event that prompted Donald Trump to say what he said. Okay, that event prompted that. Now that has been distorted out of recognizable proportion. It has been totally twisted out of what was originally said, and now it has taken on an unchangeable life of its own. It is now a tidal wave of misinformation that at this point cannot be changed in the minds of those who think that he said what he didn't say. And you can thank the liberal media for all of that because they distorted it, and, they, and they're increasing, I mean, they're um, encouraging the behavior that you see now in the media. Another thing that has been blown out of proportion is this. There was an illegal Mexican in California who raped and killed an American woman. Who knows how many others he did that to? He was caught on her. But those people who have that kind of a mindset usually have been living out those dreams and those fantasies before. So he got caught there. That, that prompted Donald Trump to say that we should send all illegal immigrants back to where they came from. That's what prompted him to say that. That event, that one event. Now listen to this very carefully. Even if that had not happened, even if that man, that illegal alien, had not raped and killed that woman, even if he had not done that, I want you to imagine this for a moment. Imagine this scenario, okay? You as an American decide that you're going to sneak into Iran, or Iraq, or Germany, or Switzerland, or Canada, or any other country in the world that has borders, which is every country in the world. Every country has borders. But suppose that you, as an American, decide that you're going to build a tunnel, or you're going to climb over their wall, or you're going to cut holes in their barbed wire fence, or you're going to sneak through an area where there is no fence and there is no wall and you don't have to dig a tunnel, you're just gonna go through because there are a lot of places like that in these countries where you could walk right through into their, into their country. Suppose you do that in the middle of the night and you sneak into their country. You now, have officially broken their laws. You now officially are a criminal. And by law, in that country, as a criminal, they have a right to do some things to you. Some of them will cut your head off for doing that. Some of them will cut your head off even if you're there and they catch you and you went in legally. But we're not talking about them. We're talking about more moderate countries. Suppose you snuck into one of those countries and you, 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 you settled in with the locals and tried to make yourself look like you belong. And one day, the authorities catch up to you and they ask you for your documentation 
your paperwork that says that you're here legally and you say, I don't have any. And they say, how'd you get into this country? And you don't have an answer. Let me ask you this. Do they have a right to put you in prison? Do they have a right to expel you out of their country and kick you out of your country and send you back where you came from? Do they have the right to do that? Every country in the world would export you from their midst if you entered their country illegally. Every country would do that and no one would bat an eye if they did. But in the United States of America, somebody says you're here illegally and we're sending you back where you came from and the people rebel and they rise up against the authorities and they riot and they cause disturbances and many are angry that anyone would say that we're going to send you back where you came from. Are you kidding me? Seriously? You entered our borders illegally. That made you a criminal. You violated the law. Every single American should agree that if that happens, they should send them back where they came from, period. They're not here legally, period. That's the rule. That's just how it is. And if you're an American, you should agree with that. Not riot and cause problems and cause trouble. Now, this is where I grew up, Madawaska, Maine. This is the street. This is called Mill Street. This is Fraser Paper that makes paper for all kinds of organizations across the world. It's one of the largest paper mills in the, in the whole country. This is the bridge that takes you to Canada. This is the United States. This is Madawaska, Maine. That's Canada. I was born right on the other side of that building right there in a hospital. I was, a, I was born in Canada. I have dual citizenship. I am a Canadian and I am an American. This is a closer view of the border. When you cross, when they're coming from Canada to the United States, they pull up to customs. And there's a, there's a, there's a snow cone there. Well, actually, let me give you this view, because that's what it usually looks like over there, snow, okay? <laughs> so when you come through the border, you have to stop. Now, my brother still lives in Madawaska. My brother owns a business in Madawaska, and he owns a business in Canada, in both places. So he crosses the border four, five, six, seven times every single day. Every time he crosses this border right here, although they know who he is because he's being videotaped, he has to hand them his passport every single time. Guys he went to school with, he has to hand them the passport. Okay, and they check his passport to make sure that he's coming back into the country legally. That's just this one itsy bitsy little border. Every single person that crosses from Canada on this border has to verify and document who they are and what they're coming to do in the United States of America. Where are you going? Who are you going to see? What are you doing? That's the questions they ask you at that border. Everybody. When you cross into Canada, there's the Canadian customs right here. When you cross into Canada, same thing. Your passport. Where are you going? How long will you be here? How long have you been in the United States? Those are the questions they ask you. One of my nieces, who was born in Madawaska, has a felony in her past. She cannot cross the Canadian border and go see her grandmother, who lives over here. She cannot do that. They do not allow somebody with a felony going from Madawaska into Canada. It cannot be done. So the borders, the borders are very strict. The laws that are implemented at the borders are very strict. So what do these people do? They go down river about a mile, open country. You can cross across, you can walk across the river in most places. And you can go from Canada to the United States and from the United States to Canada, which is why that part of the world was one of the largest drug smuggling areas in the entire country of the United States when I was growing up. More drugs crossed from Edmonston to Madawaska, Maine than any other place. Drug lords from all over the world would come to Madawaska. They had built their own airplane strip to land here and get, come and get drugs. 
crystal methadrine was manufactured in Quebec City, and it crossed this border right here for many years. That's how it was. And then things started getting, they started cracking down, and so they built some downstream about a mile, two miles. They, they actually built a place where they could pull a boat, an empty boat with a wench, and, a, and they'd pull the boat full of drugs, and they'd send the boat back and forth from one side to the other. That's what that was like over there. But if, if these farmers in this town found out that somebody from another country had illegally crossed the border, that man would have a bunch of farmers hunting him down with a bunch of shotguns till they found him. That's what would happen if they crossed the border over here. A couple of years ago, I read on a Facebook page, a face, Madawaska Facebook page, and it said, if you come here with your pants hanging halfway down your behind, we're going to fill your behind with buckshot. <laughs> that's, that's where I'm from, okay? That's where I'm from. So, here's the thing, okay? If you enter this country illegally and you sneak through our borders at night undetected, you have committed an offense, you are a criminal. If you are arrested, you will be sent back to your country. That's all Donald Trump said. That's all he said, okay? It has been distorted, it has been lied about, but that's all he said. He didn't say anything more. He didn't say anything less. He didn't say he hates Puerto Ricans. He didn't say he hates Mexicans. He did not say he hates Muslims. That's not what he said. Okay? He's not, he's not a racist. He has, he has one of the largest corporations in the United States. He's got thousands of black people that work for him. He's got Hispanics that work for him. He's got everybody working for him. He's not a racist. Okay? So, what, I'll tell you what is going on. He's not a politician. And there's a word you're hearing in this political race that you've never heard before. The establishment. The establishment. Who's that? Politicians who control everything are looking at this man that they can't control and they're freaking out. He's paying for his own campaigns. He's paying for his own advertising. Nobody can buy him. Nobody can own him. Nobody can tell him what to do. And he wants to make America great again. And they're afraid of that. They're afraid of that. Now, if you want to know who I'm voting for, I'll tell you. I'm voting for whoever is running against Hillary. I don't care who it is. It doesn't matter who it is. See? But I know one thing that the minds of the American public that have been infected by the liberal media, people who don't have the ability to think logically and examine a situation and do their own thinking, have been infected by this poison that the media has put in their heads, and now you see them. Like lambs led to the slaughter, they're all yelling and screaming and holding up the wrong kinds of signs. That all, most of those signs are all lies based on what the liberal media put in their heads. That makes sense? Listen, I'm just saying. That I'm, I've just been thinking about it. I'm like, you know. If you're a logical thinking person, you can see through all that deception, okay? So let's begin our message today, all right? I know I said turn to Romans 6, and we'll get there momentarily, but it may not have looked like it in the past few weeks, but we were, we've actually been in the book of Romans. We've actually been in Romans chapter 6. Now, I know we talked about sanctification, for four weeks. But that was all because of Romans chapter 6. Romans chapter 6 has been labeled sanctification. And so I questioned that. And for the past four weeks, I've given reasons why I don't believe that that is accurate. I mean, we talked about striving lawfully. 
And if a man also strive for masteries, yet is he not crowned, except he strive lawfully. You know, there's a, there's a way. There's a way doctrinally to do the Christian life. It's not a hodgepodge of whatever you want to believe. There is a body of doctrine that was committed to our apostle that governs the way and what we believe about Jesus Christ today and our relationship to him and how it's arrived at and our standing with Christ and our identification in Christ. Doctrine that can only be found in Romans to Philemon. We talked about this verse, 2 Timothy 2.20. But in a great house, there are not only vessels of gold and of silver, <clears throat> but also of wood and of earth, and some to honor and some to dishonor. If a man therefore purge himself from these, he shall be a vessel unto honor, sanctified and meet for the master's use, prepared unto every good work. These verses to me sum up the matter of the fact that sanctification is not just being separated unto the Lord. Sep sanctification is being separated unto the Lord, but that's not all. Sanctification in this verse clearly, very clearly happens after a man purges himself from the wood, the hay, the earth. So I'm re-emphasizing re this again because this passage of Scripture can be lost in the arguments that people will have about sanctification and they can discuss sanctification as though these verses are not in the Bible. These verses are in the Bible. This verse tells you something about sanctification that no other verse in the Bible tells you about. That is, sanctification happens after you have done something. These verses cannot be removed from that. Many people did not understand when I said that there was something you had to do in connection with your sanctification, that you had a choice in sanctification. This is the choice that Christians have. You can purge yourself from false doctrine, or you can choose not to purge yourself from false doctrines like hundreds of thousands of denominational Christians do not. You have that choice. You're sitting here because you made a choice. That's a choice you made. But if you don't purge yourselves, that is a choice you made. You have a decision about that. That's what I meant when I said sanctification, you have a choice in it. People who don't do this are not striving lawfully. There's another passage of, of Scripture that speaks to this subject in, an, in another way, but still focuses on the truth that you must do something. Not, not something to be saved. We already know you can't do anything to be saved. We already know that. That's, that's a gift. <laughs> you got that by grace through faith. But keep this verse in mind. If any man also strive for masteries, Yet is he not crowned, except he strive lawfully. You keep that verse in mind. Strive. Crowned. Strive. Crowned. Know ye not that they which run in a race run all? 1 Corinthians 9.24 But one receiveth the prize. So run that ye may obtain. And everyone that striveth for the mastery is temperate in all things. So Paul likens the Christian life to a race. At the end of this race, there's a prize. Only one receives the prize. Now, the thought here is not that only one person can receive the prize in the Christian race. I mean, the thought is that he's speaking to us individually and that we're all in our own individual races and only those who run their race according to God's prescribed method, those who are striving for the masteries, will win the prize. What is the prize? Notice the last part of verse 25. Now they do it 
to obtain a corruptible crown, but we, an incorruptible. We're doing it to obtain an incorruptible crown. It's about a crown, isn't it? The crown is the prize. The prize is the reward. A prize is something you earn. Paul called it the reward of the inheritance, reigning, the crown. Strive lawfully, yet is he not crowned. Notice he says in verse 26, I therefore so run, not as uncertainly. <laughs> I don't do this like I don't know what I'm doing. Paul has a purpose. He has a goal. He has a method. He has a specific way that he's running, and it's according to the revelation of the mystery. It's the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery. The Christian life is likened unto a contest, and there are contestants. Know ye not, Paul said, know ye not that they which run in a race run all, but one receiveth the prize, so run that ye may obtain and every man that striveth for the mastery is tempered in all things. The contestants are those who have trusted in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ to save them. And the Christian life is also likened unto a race. Every Christian is running. But they're not all running to win. Some Christians are running in the wrong direction. I preached something similar to this several years ago where I went to the timeline here and showed how in the dispensation of grace some people are running back to the Gospels. They're running back to the kingdom. We're reaching forth unto those things that are before and we're pressing towards the mark. We're running in the right direction. There are people running in the right direction. There are people running in the wrong direction and they're not running, they're not running so as to obtain the prize. They're running in the opposite direction of the prize. So Paul sees a contest, he sees the contestants, and he sees the crown. Notice in this chapter how Paul talks about his preaching will get him a reward. 1 Corinthians 9, 16, For though I preach the gospel, I have nothing to glory of, for necessity is laid upon me. Yea, woe is unto me if I preach not the gospel. Notice, for if I do this thing willingly... I have a reward. But if against my will, a dispensation of the gospel is coming unto me. But if he does this thing willfully, he has a reward. We've said from the beginning of this thing that every time Paul used the word reward, it was something that you earn. A reward is something you earn. A prize is something you win. The crown is something you earn. It's not a gift. The reward is the prize at the end of the race, which is the crown. They do it to obtain a corruptible crown, but we run this race to obtain an incorruptible crown. But it's only for those who run so as to obtain. There are some who are running, but it's not so as to to obtain. It's only for those who strive lawfully. It's only for those who purge themselves from false doctrine. It's only for those who have not been moved away from the hope of the gospel. It's not for everyone. Everyone will go to the judgment seat of Christ. That will happen. Everyone's work will be tried by fire to see of what sort it is. Everyone's work will do that. We talked about the works last week. The doctrine of works. What, what works what was Paul talking about? I'm not going to revisit that. So what I tried to accomplish <clears throat> in the past four weeks in discussing sanctification is that it had nothing to do with stop sinning. It doesn't have, sanctification doesn't have to do with stop sinning. That's another part of your Christian life. One that no Christian has perfected yet. And not one Christian will ever perfect that on this side of eternity. So we're in Romans now. Romans chapter 6. 
And I want to just take a bird's eye view again of what we have seen so far in the book of Romans and how Romans chapter 6, especially beginning at verse 12 to the end of the chapter, how that section of scripture fits into the whole scheme of what Paul has talked about in Romans from the beginning of Romans till verse 12. I want to show how that passage of scripture fits into the whole scheme of things. So in chapter 3, you have the whole world condemned because of sin. No one escapes that peril. No one escapes that judgment. The law has declared that there is none righteous, no, not one, that all the world has become guilty before God, that every mouth may be stopped. That's, that's the condition of the whole world. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And then we get to Romans chapter 4. And in that chapter, I only preach two messages. And one of them is, what do you do for salvation? Absolutely nothing. And we used Abraham and we used David in those chapters to, as illustrations to demonstrate that they did nothing to be in right standing with God. That they were declared righteous by doing nothing. And we demonstrated that. In Romans chapter 5, showed your, the results of your justification before God. It showed that your, the righteousness of Christ was imputed unto you, that you have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand, that you have peace with God, you have eternal life that can never be taken away from you. And then you get to Romans chapter 6. And in between Romans 5 and 6, Paul anticipated an objection. Paul, you've been talking a lot about grace. You're saying now that we can't do anything to earn our right standing with God. That everything is about grace and you've been emphasizing grace. You're emphasizing grace so much, Paul, that are you saying that we should continue living in sin? That grace may abound? And of course, Paul, God forbid. No, and then he takes us on that incredible journey that we took with Jesus Christ in the death, burial, and resurrection. And that not were we just buried with him, but we were raised with him. And not just that we were raised to walk in newness of life, but we were raised to be seated with Christ in heavenly places. That's our position with Christ right now. It's already a done thing. So of course you should not be, you should not continue in sin, that grace may abound because you have been removed from where sin reigned in your life and sin controlled your life and sin dominated you and you were buried with Christ and you were raised up here in newness of life. You were raised up in Christ. You've been removed from that realm where sin abounded and where sin controlled you and where you had no, no choice but to sin. And all the things that have said have been said in Romans so far have led up to this verse. Verse 12. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body that ye should obey it in the lust thereof. And we did a full detailed exposition of that. So listen, Paul says, it was sin that sent Jesus Christ to the cross. It was sin that made you guilty before God. It was sin that made it necessary for God to send Jesus Christ to die on your behalf. It was sin before your salvation that ruined your life. Don't let sin reign in your mortal body now that you have salvation and now that you have been declared righteous by God. Don't let the way you were living before now control you after you're saved. That's what Paul is saying. That's where we're headed in Romans chapter 6. This section of Romans 6 is about not doing the same things after you're saved that you did before you were saved. That's what Romans chapter 6 is about. And Paul will summarize this last section of Romans 6, which we're going to finish Romans 6 next week. 
But he finishes the last section of Romans 6 by asking this question. Verse 21. What fruit had ye then in those things whereof ye are now ashamed? For the end of those things is death. So, I mean, the, 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 the thrust, the idea, the implication that Paul is presenting is this. Why in the world would you keep doing the things that as you look back on them now, things you did before your salvation, you were ashamed. Now you're ashamed that you even did those things. And what fruit did you have in those things? What was the result of those things? What, were, what did those things produce in your life? Well, the end of those things is death. But that's not all. That's the end of them. What about the beginning and the middle and the process of them? The end of those things is death. What fruit did you have in those things? What did they profit you in your life? <clears throat> you know, King Solomon answered that question. I mean, here was a man who tried everything. He tried wisdom. He tried learning. He tried pleasure. He tried riches. He tried building palaces. He was interested in architecture and art and culture. He had more woman than any man in the universe has ever had. He had more wealth than any man in the universe has ever had. He makes Donald Trump look like a pauper, since we're speaking about that. He had so much wealth that the Queen of Sheba came to see it. Because she couldn't believe her ears when they were telling her of all the things that he had. And when she finally got there and saw everything he had, she said, the half hath not been told me. That was so amazing. Solomon looked for satisfaction. And he experimented with the whole gamut of earthly and worldly possibilities. And what did he have to say about his life. How would Paul have, how would Solomon have answered this question? What fruit had ye then in these things whereof ye are now ashamed? Well, in Ecclesiastes 1.3, he said, What profit hath a man of all his labor which he taketh under the sun? In 2.11, he said, Then I looked on all the works that my hands had wrought, and on the labor that I had labored to do. And behold, all was vanity and vexation of spirit, and there was no profit under the sun. Chapter 5, 16. And this also is a sore evil, that in all points... As he came, so shall he go. Job said, I came with nothing, I'm going with nothing. And what profit hath he that hath labored for the wind? Because even the archives of, ge of uh, the geological archives are covered in the sands of archaeology today. They labored for the wind that covered them. And then he actually began the book of Ecclesiastes telling you what the whole book meant. He said, Vanity of vanities, saith the preacher. Vanity of vanities. All is vanity. You know what that means? Soap bubbles, soap bubbles. All is soap bubbles. They look good. There's a kaleidoscope of colors. Oh, look at the soap bubbles. Gone. Vanity of vanities. 
everything this life has to offer is empty. Now, this is obviously still true today. You know, when we were younger, we think the fast life, drugs, drinking, partying, oh, all those are fun. I mean, that's the difference between a Christian and a non-Christian, isn't it? Why don't you want to be a Christian? I'm not going to have any fun. I mean, isn't that the bottom line of life? We've got to have fun. Can't have any more fun doing what you're doing. But what I'm doing, I'm having fun. Well, let me ask, you know what? Why don't we revisit this question in 20 years? Why don't we revisit this question in 30 years? Are you still having fun? Why don't we revisit this question in 40 years or 50 years? Why don't we revisit this question on your deathbed? Are you still having fun? Are you not rather ashamed now of all the things that you thought you were having fun with and now you realize that those things in fact ruined your life? Didn't those things that you were having fun with cause your divorce or your divorces? Didn't those things cause chaos between you and your children? Didn't those things that you were having fun with create chaos between you and your parents? Didn't those things that you had fun with destroy your life and your health? And didn't you lose some jobs over it? And didn't those things that were fun waste your money and waste your time when you first started doing those things that were fun? They were fun, weren't they? But then they came back to bite you and laugh at you and mock you and ridicule you. What fruit then did you have in those things whereof now ye are now ashamed? I mean, think back on those things you had fun in and think of the ruin and the shame that they wreaked in your life. They took your family from you. They took your health from you. They destroyed your reputation. They knocked out your God-given faculties to think and complicate and look at the world in a logical way. They turned you into a bumbling idiot. There is pleasure in sin, but the Bible said it's only for a season. It's only for a season, and then it removes its mask, and it bites like a viper, and it brings you into the reality that this life is transient and temporary, and everything is vanity. Everything is vanity. In this section of Romans chapter 6, Paul is basically saying, why would you want to continue living now that you're saved the same way you were living before you were saved? And that is not called sanctification. In Romans chapter 12, he's going to define it and address it for exactly what it is. This is called your reasonable service. Sanctification has to do with something in the future. You were separated to go here. That's sanctification. This is your reasonable service. This is what one man said, after Jesus Christ saved me, the only thing I could do was render a life back to him that could somehow reflect my gratitude for what he did for me by dying for me. Next week, we will finish Romans chapter 6 and we will finally get to Romans chapter 7 where I see so much confusion about Romans chapter 7. Amen? you don't know Jesus Christ as your Savior and you think you're having fun, let me tell you, your fun 
is about to end. And if it's not about to, one day it will. And that fun will turn into horror and heartache and disgrace. And if that's what you want, keep doing it. Keep doing what you're doing. Keep having fun. Because one day it will turn and bite you like an adder and inject its venomous poison into your veins. But today Jesus Christ offers you salvation. He offers you the free gift of eternal life. And he offers you forgiveness of everything you've ever done in your life. That's the offer that he makes to you today. And today is the day of salvation. How shall you escape if you neglect so great a salvation? Don't play with eternity for the temporary, transient satisfaction of having fun today. Let's pray. Lord, I just thank you this morning that we could look at the Word of God and, you know, arrive at deductions, arrive at conclusions based on the Scripture, not based upon our own ideas or what we heard or what people think they mean. But what saith the Scripture is the all-important question that every one of us must answer one day. I thank you for this time. I pray that if anybody does not know Jesus Christ as their Savior, that today they will bow their heart, acknowledge their guilt before God, and believe that Jesus Christ died, was buried, and rose again the third day according to the Scriptures, and He died for them personally. I pray that some people will believe that today and be saved and be forgiven. I pray all these things in that name that is above every name, the name of our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ.